There's a lot you can do with Synology devices, but there's some lesser known things you can do, which is what we're gonna take a look at in this video. Some of this you might've seen already, but what we're gonna do is take a look at seven different things you can do with your NAS that most people aren't aware of so that you can get more out of your device. So I wanna jump right into it, and the first thing we're quickly gonna look at is if you are a Synology Drive user. Now this is my test NAS here, so I just installed Synology Drive, but what you're gonna see, this is kind of a new feature, at least I think it is. In the advanced features, what it allows you to do is it allows you to activate some of these advanced features. So when you select the activate button, what you're gonna to have to do is actually log in with your Synology account. So you have to have a Synology account for this. But after you sign in and it's activated, what you can do is actually remote wipe devices. So you can also restrict downloads and watermark. I think that for certain users, these are gonna be powerful features, but this remote wipe feature, I actually really like. So let's assume you're in a situation where you lose your phone or you lose your device. So what the remote wipe feature does is when you unlink a device from your account, it will go through and it will actually delete all of the files on that specific device. So in the event of losing a phone or if you lose a laptop, for example, if you have your Synology Drive files on it, the next time that device connects to the internet, the files are wiped. So I'm gonna overlay a video at this point of how it works, but the idea is as soon as you unlink the account, it will automatically remove all of those files, so you'll be confident that all the files will be removed. Now keep in mind, this is not something that can work without an internet connection. So if for whatever reason, the actual device is taken offline and it's never connected to the internet, it is not gonna work, but, if it is, you will then be able to have those files automatically deleted. The other features are great as well. They're just things I don't think most people will use. The restrict downloads could be very helpful if you're working with a team. And the watermark feature is cool as well, but this remote wipe feature I think is gonna be the most helpful. So the next thing we're gonna take a look at is actually inside of Container Manager. Now, if you set up specific containers on your Synology NAS, you might use a bridge network interface or you might use a Mac VLAN network interface. But the idea is that in past versions of DSM, you are actually able to go in and assign multiple networks to a specific container when you are creating. Now inside of the new version of Container Manager, it actually doesn't allow you to do that. So the way that you have to do it is select the network tab, and then from there you can select manage on a specific uh, network interface, and then you can assign it to whatever container you actually want to. So I've received a bunch of questions about this, and I am not the person that actually found this in an earlier video that I made somebody pointed it out. So whoever did that, thank you very much. But that is the way that you can add multiple network interfaces to an individual Docker container. So the third feature is actually a virtual DSM instance. So inside of DSM, if you were to install Virtual Machine Manager, you can set up a new virtual machine that is actually a virtual machine instance running on your Synology NAS. So right now I have it set up here, and if I go and I connect to it, you'll see that this is running virtually on my Synology NAS, and it's actually a complete virtual DSM instance. So everything that you're used to will automatically work inside of here. So you can use this for testing, you could use this just for a second environment. There's various things you can do with it. But the idea is that it all runs inside of Virtual Machine Manager. I have a tutorial on how you can set this up. I'll leave a link in the description. But it's pretty straightforward, honestly. If you go and create it, you'll see the Synology Virtual DSM section. And you can just kind of run through it and select, for the most part, the default values. You could select how many CPUs you want to use, how much memory you want to use. And then you could specify a total for the actual disk. And then you just go through and, and run through this process. The one thing that I want to point out is that you're only allotted one free license for this. So in the license section, there's a virtual DSM uh, option here, and you'll see that you'll have one free license available. So obviously you can only run one virtual DSM instance, but you get one for free and you can purchase additional ones if you, for whatever reason, had to run multiple virtual DSM instances. So the next one is Login Portal. So inside of the control panel in the Login Portal section, you'll see applications here. I've mentioned this in a few videos, but certain applications you install will actually set up a login portal that you can use to actually log in directly to that application rather than going through DSM. So one of the ones that I wanna show is for Synology Photos because Synology Photos 
is actually one of the login portals that I use a lot. Anytime I wanna access Synology Photos, I will generally do it through this login portal. So after Synology Photos installs, what you'll see is that this was our login portal before, and now if I go through and refresh it, you will see that Synology Photos exists. So if you edit this, you can actually specify specific ports that you wanna use. So I'm just gonna specify 7003 at this point. But after I save this, what I'm gonna do is actually log out, and then I'm gonna to go to the IP address of my NAS, and I'm gonna append port 7003 to it. What you'll see is I'll actually be logging in directly to the Synology Photos application. So after I go through and enter my password in, you will see that this is a web interface for Synology Photos. Now one exists for Synology Drive and one exists for various other uh, Synology applications. But if we go back into Synology DSM, you will be able to see from whatever applications you have installed in this login portal, what applications you can log directly into. The two most common ones I've used are Synology Drive and Synology Photos. But if you just wanted users to log directly into FileStation, for example, you can set that up. There's various different ways that you can utilize this, and there are various different login portals you can use, so definitely a powerful feature. So the next one is actually a quality of life thing, but in the user and group section, what you'll see is that you can actually allow non-administrator users to reset their forgotten password. So what this would allow you to do, you have to go through and uh, configure email notifications, which I will quickly do. Give me one sec. So I went in and quickly set up email notifications. Uh, it'll walk you through the process. Gmail is honestly probably the easiest way to do it. But after you save this, if you were to go and sign out and then access the DSM portal or whatever portal you'd like, and you type in a username, there will be this forgot your password option. Now you have to have email addresses set up for your users. So you would have to go through and make sure that all of your users have email addresses set up. But after you do that, what you can actually allow non-administrators to do is go in and reset their password, and then you will not have to worry anymore if for whatever reason, they forget their password. So the next thing is actually gonna be logging. And obviously, if you ever run into a problem on your NAS, the first thing that you should check if you can get into DSM is the logs. See if anything exists, see if it points you to whatever problem you're running into. But, you can actually use the log center as a log receiver. So what I mean by that is I went through and I configured this for my uh, Unify controller. So on the Unify controller, I specified a remote server where all of my logs will be sent. And what that actually allows me to do is receive them on the NASA side, and then I can look through them directly inside of log center. So I just expanded the host name, but what you'll see is I have various logs currently being sent from my access points and if my switches have any problems they will automatically send that information to my Synology. So anytime that I have a problem which this I set this up a while ago I think I was experiencing a problem at the time but anytime I have a problem I can view all of the logs from inside of here. So if you look at it from the perspective that you could set up your Synology to be your central logging server as well and you just have it kind of receive all of those logs, you can look through all of the logs for your local network or for whatever, um, and actually manage them all on your NAS directly through the Log Center application. So the last thing I wanna show is actually not really a feature or anything like that, but it's something that I think everybody should have set up. And inside of the storage manager, you can select your hard drives and you'll see all the drives currently added to your device. But inside of this settings section here, you can actually create a scheduled task that will run smart tests. Now you can configure it to run quick or extended tests, and you can either select specific hard drives or you could test all supported drives, and this will be the hard drives that you have in your device. Uh, but the idea is that you can specify a schedule and you can have it run every three months, for example, but you can either do quick tests and extend or extended tests, or you can do both. So you can set up one task for quick tests and you can set up one task for extended tests. The idea behind this is that after you configure it, what you can do is in this advanced section, you can actually set up a monthly drive report to be sent directly to your email. So if you configure it, what it will do is run through the tests at whatever frequency you set, and if it discovers a problem, it will automatically email you. 
very powerful because obviously nobody wants failing hard drives. So if you're notified of it, you can proactively replace those drives if you run into any problems. There are also SSD endurance notifications you can set up. SSDs have endurance. Generally, it's TBW terabytes written, but each drive will have a default terabytes written where generally that's where your warranty will expire. But from that point, that's all measured through something called endurance. So you can actually set up endurance notifications if you'd like, so that if for whatever reason you have SSDs inside of here or you are using uh, NVMe cache drives or even NVMe volumes, if you get close to the endurance maximum, you can go in and actually receive a notification so you know it's almost time to replace that drive. Now these were seven things that I think could potentially add some value. There were other things I thought of to add to this list, but truthfully, you probably set them up or they're not that important. Generally, I think these are some lesser known features, though you might have implemented all of this, I'm not sure. So hopefully you got some value out of this. If you did, please consider giving the video a thumbs up. If you like this type of content, please consider subscribing to the channel. And if not, I will see you guys next time.